We are now live. Yes, yes, the audio is being picked up. So there we go. Um, <clears throat> thank you for bearing with me. I've been moving the computers around over the last few days and I haven't, I've only just moved the computer back in here. So uh, we're all on. Thank you very much for everybody for joining me. Um, yeah, this is the Gaming Rules monthly live q and I do these once a month, usually around the end of the month. Uh, there's a few new, new people in the chat. So yeah, hello to all the new people, who, hello to all of the existing people. Um, and yeah, thank you very much to all of my Patreon supporters. Uh, this video and a lot of the other content that I make is only possible through the support of my Patreon campaign. Uh, and the Patreon campaign funds one of these every month. So uh, let's crack on. I'm going to be doing questions first. Um, first of all, on my BGG Guild, if you are not a member of my Board Game Geek Guild, please go onto Board Game Geek, sign up to the Guild. It's Guild number 2258. Join and subscribe. There's some good discussions going on on there about things. Um, and I post on there and ask people to ask me questions in advance. I'm going to go through those first. Then I'm going to go through all the questions that I've been asked on the Board Game Trading in Chat UK Facebook group. And then I'm going to go to live questions. Now, if you do have any live questions for me now, Vicky, who is sat just over here, she's waving at me, I'll wave back. Um, she's going to be adding them to a document and I will see them later on. So feel free to start asking me questions now if you want to, but I'm not going to get to them for about 30, 45 minutes, something like that. But I will get to them just, just later on. Um, we're also doing a contest. So at some point in this show, I will be giving you uh, um, a word which you need to email me uh, and that will get you added to the prize draw. And in fact, um, I'm going to keep the contest open until tomorrow. So if you're watching this uh, later on tonight or tomorrow, then you can still enter the contest. I'm going to close the contest at probably... 10 o'clock tomorrow night, so 10 o'clock Thursday night, UK time, I'll close the contest and I'll go through all of the emails that I've had at that point. I'll give you the code word later on. So first thing to do is to start going through the questions. Uh, where's the document? The document is here. Right, so first question in from Gareth Fleming. Hi Gareth, uh, are there any digital versions of games that I have played recently that are likely to replace their physical counterparts? Um, so see the, answer, the answer to that is yes and no. <laughs> um, at the moment, every digital adaptation has replaced its physical counterparts. As for the future, um, again, it's still yes and no. What's happening at the moment has made a lot of us have to turn to using digital platforms to play board games. Is that going to continue for me afterwards? Yes, it is. Is it ever going to completely replace a physical game? No, it's not. Okay, there are. I still prefer a physical game. I still prefer having people around, having a physical game in front of me, and the tactileness of moving pieces around. But, you know, it's much easier to just pop on the Gaming Rules Slack channel and say, oh, I fancy a game. Anybody free? Yeah, yeah. And then we find a game and we play. We would not be able to do that, obviously, in person um, with, with, you know, with that ease. So, yeah. It's not replacing, uh, are there any digital versions that you've played that are like to replace the physical counterparts? Yeah, so no, I think I would always want to play the physical game. I wouldn't, you know, if I had the opportunity to get people around and play a physical game, I would always prefer to do that. Um, but, you know, otherwise there are certain games which are potentially easier to play online, especially the ones with the really good scripting that does a lot of the admin for you. Um, yeah, they're really good. Graham says I need a haircut. Yes, definitely need a haircut. And in fact, I'm not going to show you the back of my hair because um, I, I've had a bit of a go at it. I got so frustrated with it um, over the weekend that I just went out with a pair of scissors and started chopping it and I've made a mess of it. Vicky's tidied it up as best as she could. Um, but yeah, the top's getting, getting a little bit crazy. Um, uh, following on from Gareth's first question, he says, what physical games that don't have a digital version really need one. And the thing, this is an interesting one because as I look through my collection of board games or even collection of games which I've wanted to play for a long time and don't have, I've had a look on the Tabletop Simulator Steam Workshop and gone, oh yeah, that's on there. Oh yeah, that's on there. So I don't know, this, this is a question more for the chat. Are there any physical board games that you have that there are not on Tabletop Simulator right now. Because Tabletop Simulator, the people are making mods for games that are you know, really old and not that popular, but fans of the games are making Tabletop Simulator mods. So I, I found one for Dragon Pass the other day, which is a game I've been wanting to play for 30 years or so. Um, 
and it just never seems to happen. And there is a there is a digital mod for, for Dragon Pass. So if anybody is out there who wants to play Dragon Pass, uh, let me know, because it's, it's on Tabletop Simulator. Um, but yes, I, I, I don't know of any yet where I've got the physical board game and I haven't found the digital adaptation of it, certainly on Tabletop Simulator. Um, Hans wants to know, he's got, he's got two questions. First of all, all big conventions for 2020 have probably uh, moved to either, they've either cancelled or they've got an inline or digital version of them. What's my opinion of this? Well, I think it's good. Um, I think if all of the big conventions, so, you know, Origins, UK Games Expo, Gen Con, Essen, all of those, if they'd have all just cancelled with nothing to replace them, it would have been a bad year in terms of, uh, you know, board gamers. Because we're all going to miss going to those conventions, those of, us, those of us that go to a lot of them. So we're going to miss going to them. And of course, the online equivalent is, it's not equivalent, right? You're never going to replace the, you know, the, the jet lag, the terrible hotel bedroom, the lack of sleep. Um, all of the crowds, the smell, people smashing you in the face with a rucksack filled with games. You're not gonna, you're not gonna have any of that with an online convention. But it's it's better that we've got something, and certainly the ones which I've seen, the people who are organising it. Virtual Origins is going to be the first one in a few weeks' time. Um, they're really going to a lot of effort to try and recreate the experience. So, you know, one of the publishers that I'm working with, CGE. They have actually, they are paying for a space, a virtual space, where they can virtually show off their virtual games. Um, and there's going to be BGG interviews, there's going to be seminars. I'm actually doing a seminar myself there. So, you know, as I say, it's never going to be the same, but they are going to a lot of effort to make sure that you can try and attend from your own home. You go, oh yeah, Paul's doing a seminar on how to teach games. I'll go along to that. And instead of having to spend an hour walking around Columbus looking for the seminar room, you can just click on a link and there you go. And you will be in that seminar. So yeah, in some respects, it's actually going to be a better experience because other people are going to be able to attend it, but it's never going to replace it. Hans is saying, uh, is he going to see me on one of these online conventions? You're going to see me at all of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to be at Virtual Origins. As I say, I'm doing my seminar, but I'm also going to be doing demo work for CGE. Uh, I'm actually going to be at the... Um, the, the Virtual Board Game Trading and Chat UK convention this weekend. I'm running some games of, of code names online. They will be live streamed on my channel. So 10 and 11 o'clock Saturday and 10 and 11 o'clock Sunday. That's in the morning. Um, on my channel, I'm going to be doing some live streams of code names games. Um, then is the Virtual Origins, where I am going to be at Virtual Origins and I am going to be sitting at my Paul's demo table and I'm going to be teaching people how to play CGE games. It's all going to be done over the internet. I don't quite know whether I'm going to be using physical components and my overhead camera, or we're going to be using digital adaptations. But either way, people are going to be able to attend that convention and go, oh yeah, I've always wanted to learn how to play through the ages and Paul's got a three hour slot to teach me. Sure, I'll sign up for that and I'm going to be doing it. Um, as I say, Gen Con, I'm going to be doing stuff at. Uh, my own virtual convention, GridCon, I'll talk about that later on. So yeah, definitely going to be involved in them. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Mikkel says, if you ever fancy setting up a session of Ashes on my channel with a crazy Swede. Yes, in fact, I've already got somebody signed up for this, um, but I'll definitely, Ashes is, is a fantastic game and I don't play it enough. There is a tabletop simulator mod, I believe. I think it's been taken down, but it's still available if you find it through a back door somewhere. Um, but I could just use the physical game. So yeah, definitely want to be playing more Ashes. I've in fact got a list of games uh, that I, I want to be doing live streams of, which I just don't have the time to do at the moment, and that is on there. Right, Nick is saying, um, what are a couple of unexpected things you discovered during the quarantine, both good and bad? And I, I read this question earlier on, and I thought about the word unexpected, because this whole crisis was unexpected, you know, no, nobody expected this to happen. Um, so everything that we've discovered has been unexpected. Um, in a way. And I think th the good thing is the fact that I have discovered Tabletop Simulator um, and Tabletopia, which for the last couple of years I've kind of dismissed because I've played around with them a little bit when they came out. And I found that every time I played a game using that kind of, you know, real world physics engine, it was, a l it was very, very fiddly. 
you had to keep scrolling the camera around everywhere and it took twice as long to play a game on, on that than it did before. And because I was lucky that I had lots of opportunity to play real physical games, I'd kind of dismiss them. However, obviously with the lockdown, when I started live streaming, I was doing real footage of me playing games, moving bits around, and it's really hard work, it really is. And then, you know, just dabbling a bit with Tabletop Simulator, suddenly finding that, okay, it's a lot better than I remembered. In fact, in some ways, it's easier to play certain games on Tabletop Simulator. And also the fact that I can now not only just play games against my local friends, but I'm playing games with people around the world. I mean, you know, we did a game last week with uh, Andrea from Switzerland, and the week before that was a couple of guys in America, and Steve from Helsinki, Mo's in Kuwait. You know, all of this is going on right now, and I'm and I'm being able to play games with other Patreon supporters around the world, which I would not have been able to do earlier. Um, so that that was unexpected for me. I didn't think that that would ever happen. I didn't think I'd have that opportunity. The opportunity was always there. I just never considered using you know, tools like Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator before. So yeah, that was a good, that was an expect, that was an unexpected thing that's been good. Um, the other thing I think that's been good is that I have managed to adapt to playing games online and talking to people over Skype or Discord relatively easily. And for me, although I mentioned earlier on, I do prefer the physical tactileness of, of board games, I've been getting a lot of enjoyment from playing games against people using digital means. So that's been great. I know a few people um, who are serious board gamers like myself who have not been able to adapt. They have tried it and they have absolutely hated it. And for them, unfortunately, they're stuck at home and they're like, well, I can't play games and I've no way of playing games. Now, the, as I said, there is a way they can play games, but they don't like the online format. So, so it's a shame for them that they're not able to have that. But for me, yeah, I've been quite lucky. Um, right. Uh, Andrew is saying he doesn't have Tabletop Simulator, but he's used Board Game Arena and Tabletopia. Uh, and there is an... Uh, is there an online version of Gugong? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if there's an online version of Gugong. I've not played it. Um, but yeah, as well as Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia, which I, as I mentioned, I, I haven't used until recently. I've been playing games on Yukata, Brechtspielvelt, not Brechtspielvelt, that was 10 years ago, um, Boitageur, um, and Board Game Arena. I've been playing asynchronous games on those platforms for a long time. Um, so that's, those platforms are still there and you don't have to play async, you can play synchronously, you know, talking to each other over Discord. So yeah, th those platforms work fine. Right, just get a quick drink. Gareth also wants to know, what are my thoughts on Star Trek Frontiers? So the other week, was it last week? Yeah, it was last week. I did um, I did a solo playthrough of Mage Knight, which, as many of you will know, is, is my number one favourite game. Um, and it was voted on by my patron supporters as the game that I would do a solo playthrough of this month. So I did. But while I was doing that, somebody popped into the, the chat to ask my opinion of Star Trek Frontiers. Now, I didn't really want to answer that in the chat um, because I was trying to focus on playing Mage Knight. So yeah, Gareth is asking me my, my thoughts on Star Trek Frontiers. And I know this is going to sound bad, but I'm going to say it anyway. So I had a working relationship with WizKids because I'd worked with them on Mage Knight. Um, and it, they actually approached me when they said that they're going to re-theme Mage Knight and they're going to put it into the Star Trek universe. And would I be interested in being the lead designer? And I said, thank you very much, but no. And the reason why I said no is I still had a full-time job at the time. And although I'd worked on the Mage Knight expansions, those expansions took me a huge amount of time. Um, and it basically, it was too much time. And I knew that if I'd said yes to the design of, uh, of what ended up being Star Trek Frontiers, I just wouldn't have had the time to do it, not, not to actually design the system from scratch. So they went, they approached Andrew Parks. Now Andrew Parks is a good designer. He's done us some other games. And Andrew had already done, what had he done? He'd done something similar. I think Andrew was the one who'd converted um, Star Wars X-Wing into Star Trek Attack Wing. So yeah, he's already got experience of creating games in the Star Trek universe and con converting existing games. So they approached him and he designed it and, and he did it. Now, I, I have mixed feelings on the game. For a start, I like the fact that 
they decided to retheme it because there are people who don't like fantasy but like science fiction and like Star Trek and they have now got the game and they're playing the game which they wouldn't have done before okay and mechanically it's it's almost the same but the the the, the bits that they've changed in it I'm not too keen on and for me Mage Knight works thematically because the the Mage Knight is this I don't know person thing creature whatever of weird origin and nobody really understands them and they're not good they're not evil and they walk around and they do things and that's represented in the game by the fact that you can kill rampaging enemies and gain reputation or you can attack cities and keeps to lose reputation you can burn down monasteries which loses you loads of reputation in the game you've got you can do all of these options and it fits thematically because of what a mage knight is in Star Trek Frontiers, it's the same mechanisms, but it, it doesn't work. So when I played it, I was like, well, I'm, I'm playing the Federation, but I've got a Romulan on my ship as crew. Well, that, that doesn't fit. In fact, I've got a Romulan from like the original series on a next gen ship with somebody from Discovery, not Discovery, somebody from Voyager. And I'm like, well, this, this doesn't fit because I'm a Star Trek fan. I've been a Star Trek fan since I was a kid. So yeah, so that, that doesn't fit. And then the fact that you can blow up a monastery to get a special artifact when you're a federation ship it didn't fit so yeah it, it didn't fit with me thematically um and because i like mage knight i would always play mage knight anyway that that's my thoughts on on that game um uh John Olin is saying have you also watched the mage knight play through a couple of questions so you're looking into either getting mage knight or journeys in middle earth so can you learn mage knight solo yes you can now the first time i ever played mage knight I learned it solo and the problem with that is Mage Knight is a complex game it comes with a walkthrough book when you first get Mage Knight you should put the rulebook to one side don't even look at it and you should go through the walkthrough which is for two to four players but don't ever play for the solo rules are in the rulebook but they won't make any sense until you've been through the walkthrough so the first time you play it don't play solo play two player just play two-handed um and just don't use solo but then once you've done that then get the solo rules out because I, I i tried and unfortunately yeah the solo rules don't make sense until you've been through the walkthrough for me anyway because both are fairly expensive games what is the replayability of them well i think the replay of replayability of mage knight is extremely high because there's so many i mean even in the game that i played the other day the way that things come out means that every single game is going to be different. The layout, the board is going to be different. The enemies that you're going to be facing is going to be different. It throws a different puzzle at you every time. And then you've got your own cards. Um, so the cards that you have to try and solve that puzzle, they're going to be different every time as well. So I think the replayability of Mage Knight is massive, which is interesting because people look at Mage Knight and go, oh, well, he doesn't have many scenarios. The main scenario of Mage Knight, which is called Full Conquest, which takes six rounds to play, that has almost infinite replayability in that one scenario. So even it, you know, a lot of games these days have multiple scenarios and once you've played them a couple of times, that's it, you're done. But Mage Knight, as I say, each scenario is vastly replayable. Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-earth is a game that I want to play more of. Um, I think the scenarios in that are a lot less replayable. I have played scenario one, for example, in that game about four or five times. And okay, I'll play it, but it always goes the same way. It's the same enemies, it's the same story, it's the same things. The map is slightly different each time, but only slightly different. So it, it's the same thing. You're going through the same steps each time. Now, Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth, I think there's 14 scenarios in the game and you're supposed to play them in a campaign. So it has that going for it, which is different from Mage Knight, which isn't a campaign game. It's a you play a game and that's it. Now, the next question you've got is you're a big fan of story and narration. And this is a really interesting question because a lot of people will say Mage Knight has no story and no narrative elements. And they're right. There is no narrative in Mage Knight. There isn't even flavor text on the cards. There's no story that you, well, no, there is. At the start of the scenario, you read a little bit of blurb and that's it. There's no story during the game at all whereas Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth and many other modern games have narrative they have a story you open the door you read a bit more of the story they're very very immersive so if you're looking for narrative in that way you know in the app for Journeys in Middle Earth is fantastic it's got sound effects it looks really nice then you're probably best going with Journeys in Middle Earth however Mage Knight 
Every game of Mage Knight tells a brilliant story. You just have to tell that story yourself. So those puzzles that you face when you're fighting the city and, oh, we do that, and, oh, and then I bring the Utum Guardsmen in and they manage to block the Fire Dragon, and then I use the Illusionist to do that, and then I did that, it tells a story. So there are great stories to be told in Mage Knight, but you tell those stories yourself. Right, Rick is asking me a question which also came through as a similar question on the Board Game Trading and Chat Facebook group. And this is, presumably once lockdown is over, or maybe not, but can social distancing work with games? So let's say lockdown's over, we're all, around, we're, we're all allowed to meet up, but we have to keep social distancing. Two meters social distance, face-to-face -face gaming, is it going to work? Um, are there any adaptations that can be made to the industry or games so that we can continue to play games with each other around a table as long as we stay two meters apart? And Ian is saying, uh, oh yeah, so that's what Ian's saying. Rick is saying, is the danger of shared dice or shared cards a problem that we can't solve? I think it's going to be a problem. I don't know of many games that I've got that can be played where you don't touch a physical piece that somebody else is also touching, even if there's a shared deck of cards. Certainly, um, some of the social deduction games, like you know, Werewolf or Blood on the Clock Tower or something like that, I mean, you can play them remotely, definitely, as long as everybody's got some kind of webcam, because I think you've got to read people's facial expressions. But I think for board gaming, I think it's tricky. Ian is saying, is, the, is there any adaptations that industry could make if restrictions like these or a banner of mass gatherings were to remain in place. I'm not sure. Um, I, you'd have to look at each game on an individual basis. And I'm, you know, Trickerian that I've got set up in front of me right now. I'm trying to think how that would work with social distancing. I tell you what, I, I've done a few videos on my channel where I had the physical game set up and I was talking to other people on Skype and they weren't touching any of the components and that worked. So it, it would work. It would just be fiddly. You'd have to have one person that did everything. Other people would have to come over, look at the board and say, I want to move that to there. And then the one person running it would actually have to move that to there. In a game where you have a deck of cards, which, where you're not supposed to be able to see other people's cards, one player would have to, you know, draw the card and show it to one person and say, you, you've just drawn this. Okay, yeah, you know, you've got that. Yeah, okay. Now, you could actually have one person, you know, I'm thinking that might be tricky because then how would that person remember they've got their card? So you'd have to put a little screen. You'd have to have one person in charge of the game that touched all of the components and nobody else did. Yeah, you could do it, but it would be, it would be very fiddly. Um, Laszlo wants to know, have I ever ventured into the world of print and play games? Um, what are my thoughts on the sudden boom of these games during the last few months? I wasn't aware that there had been a sudden boom on them in the last few months. Um, but I mean, it, it, it would sort of fit because, you know, a lot of people have more time at home. Some of us don't, but some people do have more time at home. So they might have found a print and play alternative. Um, the reason why I'm saying I'm, I'm not sure why it's suddenly gained in popularity is online games retailers are still open. So... People can still go out there and play, not only play the games that they've got, well, they can't go out there, but people can go online and buy new games and people can play the games that they've got. So I don't know why there has been a rise in print and play games recently. Um, now, I've not done much of them. I did in the past when I had more free time. But now that I have a lot less free time than I used to, um, I've not gone into it because I've got, I've got so many games anyway. There are a couple of... Um, little print and play games that me and Vicky got from a website years ago and we, we had a bit of a dabble with them but you know we don't have enough time to play all of our existing games uh, let alone any print and play ones but you know back in the day five ten years ago I would like nothing more than spending you know a month of my time printing off all of these components for a game that was print and play only physically putting them all together and making my own board game but yeah don't don't have time for that now um Andrew is saying that his issue with remote play with one person making all of the physical movements is the person moving the pieces doesn't get a chance to consider their turn as they spend the downtime doing admin. Yes. And that's the problem that I had when I've been doing the games which I have been live streaming where I've been moving all of the physical stuff. Thankfully, games like Mini Express, which I did it for, Ride the Rails, which I did it for, it was okay because they're relatively simple games. 
but super complex games, I was spending so much. It, it was really hard work. Um, I, I actually, I think, I think I didn't, I think I did well, and I don't think I it showed how much of a struggle it was. But at the end of those games, I, I was absolutely exhausted. It, it was, you know, hosting the stream, playing the game, running the chat, and also moving everybody's pieces around. It was a lot of work. Now, if you've got somebody who's who's happy to do all of the admin and not play the game, then great. Um, Clary saying card stands. Yes, card stands. Could you just get me the card stands from down there? Yeah, I have some card stands made by Jason Dinger. Absolutely right, Claire. So on the subject that I was saying earlier on, yeah, so one person could have a card stand uh, and then the person who's running the game would come along, give them the card, put it in the card stand, and there you go. So that they can see it and nobody else can. And they would just say, I'm going to play that card there. So yeah, that would work. Right, Scott wants to know, you know what's coming. Uh, just when you think the year could not get any worse, socks have come alive and are rampaging through the streets. What three games do you grab to use as weapons in the great sock war of 2020? So I have my own answers to this, but I'm going to put it over to the chat. So just a reminder, we have the great sock war of 2020. What games are you going to grab as weapons in the great sock war? Now I have my own answers. I'll come back to that later on, but let me know what you think. Vicky's going to put your answers into there. Um, right, Morton wants to know, during the pandemic, many board game YouTubers have resorted to using digital board game platforms as a tool to continue to produce content, including me. Um, yes, I've been using Tabletopia, Tabletop Simulator a bit, since you can't have over for games night. However, where do, where do you stand? So where do I stand regarding these platforms outside of the current COVID-19 situation? So Morton is saying that uh, he's addicted to the physical components of a real board game and love the smell of a new game opening up. Um, or do I play games digitally whenever you can for practical reasons? So I am, I am thinking that when lockdown eventually is over and when the, when the world recovers from this global crisis that we're in, what's happened right now is actually going to change my approach. I am still going to have people over for games on a Friday night, but I think I am going to be doing a lot more digital adaptations for a few reasons. First of all, I get chance to play games with people who I don't normally get chance to play with. Uh, and I have a number of patron supporters around the world, uh, you know, in America, in Australia, uh, in Hong Kong. And I would never normally get a chance to play a game with those people. So it's nice to be able to give something back to the patron supporters that are effectively, you know, funding my work at the moment. Um, but also, it's a lot easier. So I, I mentioned earlier on, right? If I fancied playing right now, tonight, Undaunted Normandy, months ago, I would have to go, oh, I really fancy playing that tonight. Oh, well, can't do it. Or I'd have to contact somebody, you know, ring Paul up and say, do you fancy coming around and playing this? And then he would have to be free. He'd have to be available. Uh, then he'd have to, you know, get up. He'd have to come down here. Then we'd set the game up. Then he'd have to go home afterwards. Now we can go, yeah, fancy game, be there in five minutes. Da, 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 online, tabletop simulator. And if we're talking about games that are easier to play online, then Undaunted is much easier because the person who has done the mod has written a script that does all of the setup. So normally setup is like five, 10 minutes. You've got to go through the scenario. You've got to get all of the cards. You've got to set up all the boards. Is it the right side? In the online mod, you press a button and it goes, Brrr. there you go, it's all done. It even makes that sound effect. Um, so yeah, we can do that. We can play it. We can talk to each other. We can move things around. And then we can say, yeah, thank you for the game, done. And it, it's just so much easier. So I think personally, you know, once this is all over, I'm still going to be playing games online. I will get back to playing games with, you know, real people um, rather than virtual people. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah. Right. So that is the questions that came through on my BGG Guild. Again, just to let you know, Board Game Geek, Guild number 2258, go on there, subscribe. There's going to be a few discussions on there each month. Um, yeah, join in. But for now, let's um, let's have a bit of a break and I'll tell you what you need to do to enter the contest. So what you need to do is send me an email. The email address is paul.grogan at outlook.com. And let's say Trickerion, because that's the review that I'm doing at the moment. This review will be done hopefully tonight, hopefully. Um, 
and it'll be made available for Patreon supporters tonight, and then hopefully I'll be making it live tomorrow. So send me an email, Trickerian, doesn't matter if you spell it wrong. Um, and basically, uh, when did I say I was gonna do the draw? 10 o'clock tomorrow night? Yeah. So 10 o'clock Thursday night, I will do a draw. So if you are a patron supporter, please mention that in the email and you, you get a bonus entry into the hat. And yeah, somebody will win 25 pounds worth of game vouchers from Games Law. Thank you very much to Games Law for sponsoring the show. Right, so on to now the questions from the Board Game Trading and Chat UK Facebook group, which as I mentioned earlier, is hosting a virtual convention this weekend. Um, right, Jay Hutton wants to know, how many games have I worked on and do I have a favourite for whatever reason? So I've lost track. It depends what your definition of worked on is. If we're talking about a game that I've worked on in any way, shape or form, like did a rules video, helped with the rule book, did game development or anything like that, it's over 100, possibly even 150, possibly even 200. I, I, have, I have lost track. I'm involved in so many, so many games in some way, shape or form. Um, if we're looking for ones that I was like really involved in, like as a developer of the game, uh, which is which is quite a few, probably about, I don't know, maybe about 30, 30, maybe 40. Because um, sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm really involved with the development and I'm like working on it for six months and I'm involved in lots of play tests and numerous iterations and everything else. And sometimes I will actually just be commissioned to write the rule book and the game's not come out yet. And then in writing the rule book, I'll think, hmm, that doesn't sound right quite good as a rule. And I'll write to them and I'll say, would you mind if I made some suggestions? And normally they say, yeah, sure. And I make a suggestion and they go, oh, it's a really good idea. And they put it in the rule book. So at that point, I've had an involvement with that game. But if we're looking for games that I was really involved in, Mage Knight's my number one favorite game. I was involved in that. I helped design the last two expansions. Me and Phil, a friend of mine, co-designed them. So I was involved in that one. That's that's that. And also Pulsar 2849. I, I really, really like Pulsar 2849. And I was involved in that game as a developer. But yeah, that, that's a cracking game. Um, right. Graham wants to know, what has been your favourite game to play under the lockdown period? So what I did is I went to Board Game Geek and I went through all of my played games in the last two months. Now, bear in mind, I haven't actually recorded my plays for the last couple of weeks yet, but I went through them and I looked at them all and I went, mm, which ones of these have been my favourite? So the first one that I want to mention is Just One, because Just One is just brilliant. It's just so much fun and it's a laugh. Every time I play it, I have fun, I have a good time, and it's just really enjoyable. Okay, so that's just one. Then I played a couple of games of Cloudspire, and I think Cloudspire is a fantastic game. I've already named Cloudspire as my game of last year, although I won't be making that official announcement until December of this year, but there you go, spoilers. Um, so I think Cloudspire is fantastic, and I have played a couple of games of that in the last couple of months, so there's that. And I'd also got a couple of recorded games of Marvel, Ch Marvel Champions, which I think is a fantastic game as well. So. I've played a lot of really good games in the last few months, um, but if I was to pick the top three, that, that would be those. Right, Leanne wants to know, what have I learned about myself whilst I've been in lockdown? <laughs> what have I learned about myself? I don't, I don't know whether I've learned anything about myself other than, you see, the thing is, and this is, I touched on this earlier on, I think I'm quite lucky in that I've managed to adapt to the current situation and I'm fine. I'm playing games, I'm playing more games than ever before and I have adapted and I'm playing using online means and I'm producing a lot more content. I've had to learn a lot of new stuff in order to be able to do it, but I've been able to do it and I've been really enjoying it. And as, as I mentioned earlier, there are people who haven't been able to adapt. So I think what I've learned um, a, a little bit you say learnt about me, I kind of knew this already, is that I will, although I'm very, very stubborn in some respects, in other ways I will adapt to whatever the current situation is. So it's like, here's a problem, I'm a problem solver, how are we going to fix this problem? Here's how we're going to fix this problem. Um, I, I wish I'd have taken a, a look at the online Tabletopia tabletop simulator tools earlier than I did, because that's uncovered a whole extra area, um, which I'm finding really enjoyable. Um, and I think the other thing that both me and Vicky have learned about ourselves, although we haven't really learned it about ourselves because we already knew it, is that 
we are people that don't break rules. So we go to Tesco shopping, we both walk to Tesco, and then I stand outside and she goes in and does the shopping because that's the rules. Other families are going and they're both going in together. And you're not supposed to, you know, and, 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 and we stick to the rules. Um, and also there's the, the things that you see. I mean, we walked, we, we walked somewhere the other day. I think it was to the fish and chip shop or something like that. And on the way back, there was somebody parked and getting a ticket because they were parked on the double yellow line right next to the level crossing. Like literally right next to it on those diagonal bits where you're, you're not supposed to park. And he was getting a ticket. And we're like, and we were both like, why are you, why are you doing that? You know, just because I, some people I think have gone, oh, it's lockdown. Oh, resources are thin. Oh, right, right. Well, I'll go to the beach or I'll do this or I'll do that. Nobody will find out. Nobody will catch me. Or there's bigger problems going on in the world. They're not going to bother about this. And, and we're like, if you park there, somebody might use that level crossing and a car won't see them coming and they're going to get run over. Those lines are there for a reason. You're not supposed to park there. So yeah, we've been very good at following the rules, not doing things that we shouldn't be doing, uh, you know, unlike a lot of other people. Um, the other thing as well is that, you know, we, we're, we're both friends with people who are not coping well with the current situation and they're either getting lonely at home or they're getting frustrated by the fact that they can't leave the house. But the reason they can't leave the house is it's not safe. Right now, if they if they aren't aware of what's going on, they need to read the news more. And I'm afraid that, you know, if, you, if you're one of these people, and I might upset you now if you're watching this, but if you're one of these people that is complaining and saying, why can't we just leave the house? Why can't we start mingling with people? You need to look at what's going on because the hospital in Western Supermare this weekend has closed, right? The accident and emergency ward at Western Hospital has closed because the entire hospital is full of coronavirus patients. So if you chop your arm off with a chainsaw and you live in Western Supermare, you're going to have to go to another hospital somewhere else. So, you know, we're staying at home and we're sitting outside in the sun and I'm doing my videos and everything else. And we're OK, but outside the world is a dangerous place. And, it, you know, I've been speaking this week to pe people in other areas of the world and it, it's going far worse there. So, yeah just you're gonna have to stay at home I'm afraid that's how it is anyway right rant over <laughs> um Mohammed says I think you're the only content creator who has adapted the most to the situation not only the amount of videos but the variety well thank you very much I mean I've tried um and also yeah I've been doing some computer games you know because I've I've got the live streaming bug I got this new computer game last week called before we leave it's fantastic I really like it so I thought well I'll tell you what I'm going to be sat at the computer anyway. Let's do some live streams. And it's really nice because some of them I do late at night when I think, hmm, don't want to go to bed. What should I do? Oh, I'll go and do the thing. I'll go and do a live stream. And half a dozen people join in the chat and keep me company while I'm doing it. So although playing get computer games at home is very much a solitary experience, I'm actually getting quite a lot of human contact from doing it. So thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, right, Martin has been saying, Martin has asked, what have you found to be the most challenging thing about being a content creator during these troubled times? And have you had to change anything in the way you do things as a consequence? So yeah, we've, we've kind of covered this. Um, the most challenging thing has been all of the new stuff that I've had to learn. And to be honest, it's actually not been too bad. Um, but I have had to learn a lot of new stuff. I, I, I've now got a green screen. I've not got it today, but I now have a green screen when I'm doing some videos. I had to learn how to do that. I've had to learn how to do something else. Um, obviously, learning how to do live streaming using computer software, I've had to learn that as well. So there's been a lot of um, a lot of stuff that I've had to do to, in order to adapt. The most challenging thing, and this is something that I did talk about uh, on a podcast when I was a guest recently, is, um, and this probably started about six weeks ago, but I ended up in a bit of a, a spiral and I was completely addicted to live streaming. I called it Cal's disease, which is completely obsessed with live streaming. And it was, it became an obsession. Um, I started doing it because of the lockdown and I thought, oh, wait a minute. Lots of people are stuck at home. Lots of people are at home. They're scared. They can't do anything. They can't leave the house. If I start producing a lot more content, it will give them something to watch. That was the idea that I had. And a lot of people got back to me and they said, 
wow, Paul, you're really putting out a lot of content and this is really helping me. I had a number of private messages from people saying that the content that I was producing was really helping them cope with the current situation. And what that did is it triggered in my mind, right, I'll do more, I'll do more. And I ended up in a situation for probably about, it was about two or three weeks, I think it was, where I would go downstairs and I would try and have a night off and I'd sit downstairs to watch telly and I couldn't. I felt restless. And I, I had to come upstairs and do a live stream of a game. As silly as it sounds, and as much as hard work as it was to do it, I was addicted to it and I was obsessed with it. And that actually ended up causing quite a few problems because I got really behind on my work. I wasn't sleeping. And it's like every addiction, it, it became an issue. Now, thankfully, I've managed to get out of that now a bit. Vicky's not sure. Um, no, I have, I have been able to get out of it. I don't feel that urge to be live streaming constantly all the time. Um, I'm still doing a lot of it, but not as much as I did uh, did a month ago. So that that was a big challenge for me personally, because um, it was having an adverse effect on, on my health. But yeah, have I had to change the way I do things? Yeah, a lot. Um, right. Uh, me, is that you? So you're blue. Right. Thank goodness for fibre internet. Yeah. So I live in Columpton. Columpton didn't get fibre internet until July last year. Uh, We've, we've been told we were getting it for like two years. And before we had fiber internet, I had to go to the library to upload my, load my videos because they were, you know, three gig in size. If I tried to upload them from home, it would have taken two and a half days to upload a video. So I was having to walk up the high street to go to the library. Thankfully, there was a super fast internet. There was a super fast internet connection at the library. Um, so yeah, that was, that was what I had to do. And then suddenly out of the blue, last July or August or something like that, um, we found out we could get fiber internet. And it, it, you know, without that, I wouldn't be able to do any live streaming. So it would be really, it, you know, my life would be completely different now without the live streaming. And it kind of came out of the blue. Um, if this virus situation happened now, uh, if it had happened two years ago, when I didn't have the, fi the fiber that I did, yeah, I just wouldn't have been able to do anything like I'd have been doing at the moment. If you remember back a year ago, year and a half ago to my live Q and A's, they were like this, but they were awful quality. Um, so that, yeah, that's how it was. Right. Um, uh, Tony is saying that he sees that I'm the co-designer of two expansions of Mage Knight, but have you ever designed your own game? Yes and no. So I'm, I, I, I have designed my own game. Um, I've been trying to design my own games since the late 80s to be fair um and it's it's one of those things that's frustrated me for for so many years because so many other people are designing games why can't i and eventually probably about five or six years ago having been trying to design games for so long i i eventually just went right i tell you what i'm going to focus on one of them because i've had loads and loads of great ideas but never actually make them into a reality um, and I focused on one of them and I got it working and I got it working to a point where it was playable. It wasn't great and it still needed, you know, it, it wouldn't have done well and it still had some problems, but it was a fully playable game and it worked and it worked as intended. Um, it's never going to be printed. It is there. I've got the rule book for it. So if anybody wants to see the rule book, I've got the file somewhere. Um, it started out based on the Anno series of computer games and it, it changed so many times. I mean, I spent five or six years working on this and in the end, I streamlined it down to like this 90 minute card game. Um, you know, I, I had images of this massive board that would take up an entire table where you would move workers around and they would carry wood from one building to another and then you'd convert the wood into logs and you'd do all of that. Um, but anyway, yes, I have done my own game. So that monkey is off my back. Um, I still want to, I've still got some ideas in my head. I just don't have the time at the moment. Uh, Chris, he, Chris Bromley wants to know, why did I move down south to live amongst them? <laughs> well, no, if, if you think about what I moved down south when I left my job in Solihull and I got a job working in, where was the job? Stevenage. So yes, yeah, so I moved down to Hertfordshire. So my move from the north to the south was in 97 when I actually moved into Hertfordshire. Um, but then I moved down to the southwest in 2007, 2007, because uh, Vicky's from the southwest and she lived down here. And um, yeah, either she moved me near me or I moved to her and uh, yeah, I got a job down in Exeter, so I moved down here. 
Um, James wants to know how many Jaffa cakes have I had in total? So this took actually quite a lot of research. Um, I had to go back and go through all the CCTV, CCTV footage for my entire life. 14,321 is the total. Uh, have I tried the new pineapple ones yet? Not yet, but I don't know, pineapple Jaffa cakes? I mean, I've had a few of them. I've had the, I've had the cherry ones, I've had the bl black, cherry ones, I've had the raspberry ones, um, and I got some, I got given some ones, um, and I can't remember what they are. They're not a fruit that you can get here. Uh, they're from Finland. Um, but yeah, they were really nice. They're my favourite ones. Uh, Neil wants to know, he says, lockdown has made board gaming very popular and brought lots of new players, including him, to the table, albeit playing solo or with family members. So that's interesting, Neil. Are you saying that yeah, you've got into board gaming because of lockdown. How do you suggest once lockdown is over, these players break the bubble of solo and make the hobby last into the future, given it's likely that new players are probably not going to have a lot of friends already in the hobby? Okay, so yeah, if you're getting into the hobby now and you don't know anybody else who is into the hobby, get your friends into the hobby. Okay, there you go. Just just go to them with a nice, simple game like Just One or Code Names or something like that, or something, that something that's simple to teach. You know, a lot of the gateway games basically use the opportunity to get your friends into the hobby, and hopefully they will. Uh, if not, I'll say find new friends, and what I mean by that is find a local gaming group, because there's, there's bound to be a local gaming group somewhere. Um, Chewy wants to know, post lockdown, do I still see people using uh, more online gaming than ever before? Yes, absolutely, and this touches what I said earlier on. I think more people, uh, are going to be doing, you know, people are going to be doing what I'm going to be doing a lot more of afterwards. They're going to see this as a sort of, this has opened a door and they're going to carry on using this, whereas they wouldn't have done before. Uh, he's got a second question, if allowed, should more games try releasing with remote gaming option like Forgotten Waters? So I looked into Forgotten Waters, which is from Plaid Hat Games, and yes, they are introducing this um, this thing within the game where you can actually remote play it with other people. So one person needs to have a copy of the game, but they have actually put effort into making it playable remotely. Should more games try this? Absolutely. Um, and I, I know a few publishers right now have been working on alternative versions of their game so that people can play them at home, and that's great. Um, yeah, everybody needs to adapt to the current situation, and that includes publishers. Andrew Jackson wants to know, do I enjoy the hobby as much as I did before it was my job? Now, I like answering this question because, yes, absolutely, in fact, probably more so. It was always a bit of a concern because a lot of people say, you know, as soon as your hobby becomes your job, it stops being enjoyable. I am happy to say that I've now been working in the board game industry full time for, is it five and a half years or six and a half years? I think it's five and a half years full time. I was working on the side for a couple of years before that. Uh, and I'm enjoying gaming, you know, more than ever. Um, so yeah, I'm as a gamer, I'm still really, really enjoying the gaming. Um, yeah, so it's all good. Uh, Rick wants to know, can legacy games work online using Tabletop Simulator, for example? Now, this is a bit of a leading question because uh, Rick is part of my Aeon Zen Legacy group, and we are currently playing through Aeon Zen Legacy. So I have the physical game of Aeon Zen Legacy, which I would have played, but obviously we can't because of lockdown, so we're using Tabletop Simulator to play it. I am not saying use Tabletop Simulator to play it uh, and condoning the fact that, because the mod is an unofficial mod. Somebody has scanned in all the cards and they've done it there. But if you've got a copy of the game and you've already paid for it, but you want to be able to play it with other people, then absolutely. And the way Tabletop Simulator works, and this is the advantage it has over Tabletopia, is it can do all of this stuff. You can actually sticker cards, okay? And you can with Gloomhaven. Um, so we're playing Gloomhaven over Tabletop Simulator. We're playing uh, Aeon's End Legacy over Tabletop Simulator. You can stick a card. You can save the game. You can pick it up from where you left off. It's all there, right? Everything is there, and yet you can absolutely play these games. And in fact, it's potentially easier. And of course, you don't have the problem in Tabletop Simulator that you would have in real life that that game is then unplayable. Once you've put a sticker on a card, that's it, you've physically altered the game. Whereas with Tabletop Simulator, you can just reload the mod and start again. Um, right, Philip Dennis wants to know, do I see a future for the friendly local game stores when they cannot compete in terms of price with online stores? And my honest answer in that 
is I don't know how they have survived this long, okay? Because I'm I still see that some game shops are not doing online sales even now, and I don't mean now because of the current virus. I mean earlier this year or last year. There are some physical brick and mortar stores who do not do mail order. And I have no idea how they survive. They obviously do. They've, they've got a way somehow of surviving. <clears throat> I know a lot of them rely on Magic the Gathering booster sales and they run Magic the Gathering events and they do board games on the side. But yeah, retail is hard. And I, I don't know how gaming stores are managing to keep going now. I would love at some point to speak to, uh, you know, some, some retailers to find out how it works because they are, they are surviving, they are continuing. Um, I just don't know how the ones who don't offer mail order can do it because you're right you can go online and you can buy games on Amazon cheaper or you can buy them from games law cheaper or or whatever you know and a lot of online retailers are just one guy operating out of his bedroom who doesn't have any you know real overheads and they're able to offer 20 percent 25 percent off so yeah you're able to buy games much cheaper than in the online uh, much cheaper than your local stores uh, Tom Fox wants to know what are some good games to play over Skype or Zoom with family who aren't particularly used to gaming. So I'll say I'll say just one again. Um, so we uh, we've played just one now a number of times, uh, you know, with friends, family, whatever, and it just works so well because all you need is a piece of paper and a pen, and you hold it up to the camera. All you need is a laptop with a webcam or a phone or anything really, and you just use a Skype call or a Zoom call or whatever. And just one is like one of the easiest games that you can play and, and one of the funnest games as well. So definitely that. If you have any good suggestions for other games that you can play with family who aren't used to gaming, which you can play over Skype or Zoom, let me know. Vicky will add them to this bit of the thing and I'll look back later on. Now, I mentioned earlier this weekend, I'm actually going to be running some games of code names online. And that is going to be using CGE's official website which they have set up i think it's codenames.game go to that website now it's still in beta but it works fine and you can do that so if you want to play code names with your family online just have a skype call with them uh, go to codenames.game create a game put a link in and off you go um, but yeah if you've got any other suggestions for games which you can play with your family over skype or zoom or whatever pop them in here now uh, Richard Dewsbury wants to know why should we listen to me when we could be listening to Monkey? Where is Monkey? There is Monkey. Yeah, don't listen to me. Listen to Monkey instead. Um, Jay's wants to know what has been your favourite solo game to play since lockdown? So what I did is I went back again to the same list as I looked at earlier on. And the two games of Cloudspire that I have recorded in the last couple of months, um, well, two of them at least, were solo. And... Yeah, that's probably my favourite solo experience. It's very crunchy, um, but it's crunchy in terms of strategy and tactics rather than the rules. I mean, the rules are fairly complex, but I find some solo games, the amount of admin I'm having to do in the game is taking me away from the game. Whereas Cloudspire, the challenge is in making the right decisions. So yeah, Cloudspire is, the favorite, is my favourite solo game that I've played. Uh, I've got two videos on my channel of me doing solo Cloudspire in a time-lapse format. So it's basically the video is about 25 minutes long with me narrating over it. So if you want to see me playing solo Cloudspire in 25 minutes, those videos are on my channel now. A um, couple more questions and then I'll get back to the, uh, the contest. Paul Spurgeon wants to know, what do you say to people who profess to play games but it turns out that they mean Monopoly? Genuine question. Well, I've, I've actually had this. We have this quite a lot. We meet people, not that we leave the house or go out much, but occasionally we do meet people who say they play games. And then when they, it turns out that they mean Monopoly or Cluedo or things like that, um, the important thing is, is not to be dismissive and not to be too derogatory, um, which, which is Vicky smiling at me, um, <laughs> because I have such a low opinion of those games because of where I am. It's not that there's anything wrong with the people who play those games it's just i mean scrabble is fine because it teaches you words and everything else but monopoly it's an awful game i mean it's a truly truly awful game it, it goes on too long it's completely random it causes arguments it's just it's a it's just a terrible game uh, as well as the theme it promotes capital capitalism so yeah it's a terrible game um 
So what would I say to those people is, you know, try and be polite, um, explain to them that, you know, have they played any modern board games, use the term modern board games, um, and say that, you know, games have, have, have changed a lot over the years, um, and say, you know, have, have they heard of, mention Ticket to Ride, mention code names or anything like that, test the waters. Because if they say, oh, no, 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 not interested in that, we're happy with Monopoly, then, then that's fine. If they show any interest whatsoever, then, you know, explain to them and, and say, you know, do, do you ever, oh, no, we never finish Monopoly. No, it just ends up with the family arguing and then we put it away. Okay. You know, at which point you say, well, I've got some games for you that are really easy to learn, will take half an hour to play. Would you like to try one of those at some point? Yeah, try and promote the positives of it. Dave wants to know, Dave Bland says, if there was one game you wished you'd worked on the rule book for, which one would it have been? Ooh. Now this is interesting because there are some rule books out there. There are some games out there with awful rule books that everybody knows are awful rule books. Um, but I, I haven't played those games. Um, and, I'm, and I'm thinking maybe I should answer this. Maybe I should say something like Myth. The original myth when that came out which had like one of the worst rule books ever written um what was the other game um a martian one not first martians because that wasn't great but there was another one um martians a story of civilization awful awful rule book for that game but i've not played either of those games so would i have liked to have been involved or would i have wished to have worked on it <sighs> only the both of those games I've heard are actually good games, but were let down by a rule book. So by me working on them, that means more people would have actually been able to enjoy the game. If we're talking about a game which I actually like playing myself, which I think could have done with a better rule book, I'm going to have to have a think about that one. Right, don't forget to thumbs up this video. Yes, thank you very much for the reminder. Um, Obviously, this video uh, and a lot of the other videos that I make are getting hit hard by the YouTube algorithm quite bad. So. Any thumbs on the video, shares, greatly appreciated. And even comments in the video. I know a lot of you are commenting live and I can see the comments. Thank you very much for that. But if you actually leave a comment on the video as well, that all helps the algorithm. So yeah, don't forget to thumbs up the video. Um, and yeah, share it with your friends if I've said anything that you think is worthwhile them hearing. In terms of the contest, let's just have a reminder. Reminder, you need to send me an email, paul.grogan at outlook.com with the word trickerian. Um, and I will do the draw at 10 o'clock tomorrow night. So if you're not watching this live, that's fine. Um, you can still enter the contest if you are watching this any time before 10 p.m. tomorrow. Send me an email. If you're a patron supporter, mention that in the email and I'll do the draw. And one lucky winner is going to win £25 worth of games vouchers uh, from Games Law. Thank you very much to Games Law. Right. Let's scroll back up and see what, what answers we've had from Scott's question. So just a, a reminder. Uh, it's the Great Sock War of 2020. What three games do you use to grab as weapons? Uh, Adam is saying Patchwork, which might scare the socks. Good idea. Uh, Chrissy is saying, can only think of one game, Patchwork. Yeah, would, fear, would put the fear into the socks. Uh, Mohammed is saying Twilight Imperium 2. Oh, sorry, 1. Twilight Imperium, 2. Kingdom Death Monster, and 3. Gloomhaven. You've gone with the same approach that I have, where I said... Um, what did I say? I said Gloomhaven, Mage Knight, Ultimate Edition and Roads and Boats because the boxes are massive and you can store all the socks in them. That's what I was thinking. Graham Charlton says Foothills. Sounds like a good sock defence. Um, Andrew says Isle of Cats for the fear. Oh yeah, cats, socks. Uh, Twilight Imperium 4 for the massive box. TI3 was bigger though. Uh, and the plastic to attack them. Yeah, pret -a porter to remind them that other clothes exist. <laughs> nice. Uh, Nomi saying Cloudspire. Um, that should stop them, stop them socks nicely. Uh, James is saying, um, Tugtect, I think, uh, Ugtect. Oh yeah, the game with the inflatable, um, clubs. Yeah. Uh, use the game box as a defense against socks and blow up the club as a weapon. Yep. Good one. Andrew is saying zombie side, throwing the minis all around the floor. These socks are bound to pull a thread on the zombie stray zombie limb. Yes. Uh, Warren is saying mega civilization in the wooden box. Yeah. Again. Twilight Struggle Collector's Edition and 18OE, all big games. And Ian Smith is saying the washing machine game has won every pair of socks would... Yes. <laughs> one from every pair of socks would disappear every time in the washing machine. Excellent. Good answers. Um, 
Uh, also, there was a comment earlier on from Jonathan saying thanks for all the solo playthroughs that have created a treasure trove for the solo community. My pleasure. And I've got another one coming Friday. I'm doing Euthea Torment of Resurrection solo playthrough on Friday. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Right. What was the other question I asked that I wanted answers for? Has anybody given any? Which one was it? Do you remember? Okay, well, there's no, there's no answers coming. There was another question I asked earlier on and said, put your answers in the chat. Um, but I can't remember what it was for. Nope, never mind. Right, okay, so let's move on to, uh, we've had a message in from a Mr. P. Grugan who, who wants to know about virtual gridcon. Um, so let me answer you, Paul. I mean, uh, Mr. P. Grugan. Right, so virtual gridcon is happening at the end of June. So that's about four weeks from now. Um, Virtual Gridcon is the replacement for Gridcon 2, which unfortunately has had to be cancelled. In fact, I've moved Gridcon 2 to the dates that Gridcon 3 was. So it's kind of cancelled, postponed, whatever. Um, but Virtual Gridcon is happening at the end of June, and I can tell you a few things about it, and this is all exclusive information. Um, so it's going to be happening. It's going to be free to attend. Um, it's going to start unofficially on the Thursday night but it's going to open officially at nine o'clock on the Friday morning. I'm going to be doing a live stream as a, as a way of introduction. And then it's going to be non-stop gaming for three days. It's all going to be done through a Discord channel, which is going to try and virtually replicate the convention. So there'll be a general room where you can walk into the room and you can, you can look around and you can ask people, oh, does anybody want a game of Great Western Trail? Um, and you can see other people looking for games. And you say, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a game of, you know, um, roads and boats about to start on table four. I fancy that. And then there will be a lot of these virtual voice tables. So the Discord channel has already been created. We're running tests on it now, but you will go in there, you will chat with other people, find a game that you want to play together, and then you basically disappear and you play it. How you play it is completely up to you, whether you want to use Tabletop Simulator, whether you want to use Board Game Arena or, or something like that that's up to you. But I'm providing the infrastructure there so that you can find people to play games with uh, and also play games with them. There will also be a games organizer, which will be a spreadsheet. So in advance, there will be a spreadsheet available just like there would be at Gridcon, where you can look online and you can go, ah, oh, you know, Paul Harris is running a, a demo game of Scrumpy at 11 o'clock, sign up. So this, this spreadsheet will go live two weeks before the event and you can go on there and you can see what games people are planning to play and you can sign up for them in advance. And then again, how you actually do that, you, you will have to be there at the time. So we're putting the infrastructure in place for you to be able to do that. I will be doing a number of demo games myself over the weekend. Um, I've contacted some of the publishers and they want me to do some demos of their games over that weekend. So that's going to be fun, but I'm also going to get the opportunity to play a few games myself. Other things that are going to be happening, we're going to be having a virtual bring and buy. So again, there's going to be a virtual bring and buy where you can look through what people are selling and add things to yourself. Um, but then when you when you find something and you want to buy it, you just contact them and then that's it. And then you delete it from the list. So it's going to be a fairly hands off bring and buy, just like the one at Gridcon. We're also going to be having a virtual retailer. So I've arranged with Games Law that they are going to be virtually there and they're going to be offering a discount code to all Gridcon attendees. Um, so you can buy your games from from Games Law over that weekend. So that's going to be happening and I arranged that yesterday. More news to follow on that. We're also going to be raising money for charity. Now, I don't even know if I've told Vicky this yet, but um, at, at Gridcon 1 and at my charity games day, uh, we raised a lot of money uh, for the Chrysalis Youth, Emp Youth Empowerment Network um, run by Ben Parkinson over in Africa. Uh, at Gridcon 1, we raised £1,833. Okay. Now, there isn't much time for me to put things in place to be able to offer anything in the way of prizes. I'm going to try to if I have time. But over that weekend, because it because it's going to be free, I'm going to ask people to donate money to a charity. So Ben is working on a Just Giving page. So there's going to be a Just Giving page created. Ben's going to run that. And I'm going to encourage people to donate, you know, one pound a game or two pound a game or, or something like that. Or if they think, oh, now is the point where I would go to the bar and buy some cider. Instead of doing that, I'm going to go and donate three pound to charity. Something like that. We're going to try and raise as much money for charity as we can over the weekend. I will try and do some kind of giveaway if I've got 
time to contact publishers and ask them for stuff, but the amount of time that takes is usually quite a lot. So I'm not sure about that. Um, other things that are happening. So that's the charity, bring and buy, retailer, Discord. Yeah, that's basically where we are for GridCon, virtual GridCon. If you want to go to virtual GridCon, first thing to do is if you're on Facebook, go to the Facebook page for GridCon. Okay, go to the, go to the GridCon Facebook page and keep an eye on there. Um, if you're not on Facebook, keep an eye on the website, gridcon.co.uk. All of the information will be put on that website. Um, yeah, right. Uh, Gridcon line. Yes. Yeah, kind of works. Gridcon, grid online. Yeah, kind of works. I'm going to call it virtual gridcon though. Just, just sorry. I've already been calling it that. Um, right. So that is all of the questions that we've had. How are we doing for time? It's 10 past six. How many questions do we have? Are we eating dinner tonight? Have we had a lot of questions? Okay, right. I'm now going to go through all of the questions that you've been asking since the start. So thank you very much for all of the questions that have come in since we've been on, on, on air, on air. And I'm now going to go through them. Uh, so Paul Smith, what theme would you like to see in a game that you haven't seen yet? And similarly, what theme in your opinion has been done to death and feel enough is enough? It's funny, I do get asked this question, most, <laughs> most live Q and A's. Um, what theme would you like to see in a game that you haven't seen yet? I'm not sure. Um, because every time somebody comes up with a new theme, I think, oh, well, that's a good theme. You know, if we take Shakirian as an example, if you'd have said to me six years ago, what theme would you like to have seen in a game? I wouldn't have said, oh, 19th century magicians. But then somebody did it and it's cool. So that's a question I'm going to put to the chat. So question for the chat, because I can't answer it. What theme would you like to see in a game which hasn't been done before? Because, you know, part of me thinks every theme has been done. And then the logical part of me is thinking, well, surely not every theme has been done. Um, there is one that I was working on myself. And to be honest, it's not, it's not really a game. I came up with these mechanisms for a game, which I thought would be quite cool. Um, and then I spoke to Vlager about it, Vlager Zavatl, um, and he went, oh yeah, I've been designing a game that uses similar mechanisms. And I'm like, oh, right, okay. And then he stopped working on it years ago. But it was it was about journalists. Um, it was journalists working in the, in the newspaper industry and basically trying to get front page headlines. Um, now, my, mine, mine wasn't that. The game I was working on didn't have that as a theme. In fact, mine didn't have that as a theme. But the mechanisms that I had in my game is that you could choose how hard you wanted to work. You could choose to work until five o'clock at night and then go home and then go for a film and have dinner and whatever. Or you could push yourself and you could work till six and maybe seven, or you could like work till, you know, one or two in the morning. And the, me the mechanisms that I had in the game were basically you can push yourself. So you get more action points one round, but then you suffer penalties the next round because you're tired or you're stressed or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure. So yes. Um, yeah, let me know in the chat if you've got any themes that you think would make a great game that haven't been done yet. If you're asking me what, uh, what in my opinion has been done to death, every, you know, so many things. You could say fantasy has been done to death and then a new big fantasy cooperative game comes along and I'm like, yeah, I'm all over that because I like fantasy. But you could, you know, people who don't like fantasy will say fantasy has been done to death. People who don't like Cthulhu will say Cthulhu has been done to death. Now, I am a big fan of Arkham Horror Living Card Game, but I'm not that much of a fan of the Arkham Horror Board Game, nor many of the other Cthulhu-based games that are out there. I think Cthulhu probably has been done to death. I mean, everywhere I seem to look, there's another Cthulhu game popping up. And whilst I love the mythos, it's like certainly Fantasy Flight, oh, and there's another Arkham Horror Game, and then another Arkham Horror Game, and oh, and there's another Arkham Horror Game. It's like, just do something different. I don't know, but the mythos is good. Um, you know, but yeah, there is there is a few many few too many out there. Scott is asking, have I repainted the wall behind me? No, I haven't. It's still the same colour as it was, but maybe the colour correction is making it look a different colour. Um, of course, you haven't seen it recently because I've been using the green screen a lot, but I've had it out today for this. Um, uh, Lone Jedi 70, which is Jason, says, I'd like to hear Paul's thoughts teased during the Mage Knight solo stream regarding Star Trek Frontiers. Rewind. Yeah, so I, I said that earlier on. Um... Graham wants to know, a game about overworking, very Paul. Yes, in fact, 
the reason I came up with this mechanism was because of where I was in my life about three or four years ago, where I was working 70, 80 hour weeks nonstop and I was getting really stressed and it was having a really negative impact on my productivity. And I thought, there's got to be a game in here somewhere. There's got to be some game in there. So it was inspired by uh, real life events. Well, I'll get Vlager to put that in the box, inspired by real life events. Um, uh, Scott is saying that his internet died during the reading of the sock war games. I think the war might have started. Grab those games, attack the socks. Yes. <laughs> so the, the question got answered. You can rewind, you can watch it later on. Um, James is saying, have I done a Gloom of Killforth solo run through as I'm struggling to understand the rules? And if not, would you do one? Now, this is going to be a difficult question for me to answer um, because I want to be honest but I also don't want to upset people and I don't want to upset the designer who might be watching this, who might not be watching this. And it's his, actually his birthday today. So Tristan Hall, designer of Gloom of Killforth, is his birthday today. Happy birthday, Tristan, if you're watching. And the thing about Gloom of Killforth is I have a lot of respect for the game and I have a lot of respect for what he's done, what Tristan has done, which is he designed this game, which he described when he first spoke to me about it many, many, many years ago as a cross between Mage Knight and Talisman. Tal uh, Talisman, uh, you know, one of the games that I hate more than any other game out there because it's just completely random, but when I was 13 years old I would spend 10 hours a day playing Talisman. That's what I did back then. Now, no, wouldn't go near it. Um, I wouldn't even go near it for nostalgia reasons, really, having experienced Hero Quest last week that, yeah, really wasn't a good game. Um, what was I saying? What was I talking about? Oh yeah, so he described it as a cross between Mage Knight and Talisman. And Mage Knight is my number one favourite game, okay? So I was very curious about the game. And it was a print and play for years. And then eventually he got so much support from the community, from the gaming community, that he decided to actually print it as a proper game, okay? And he did a fantastic job with it. And he's gone on now, he's now got his own business, he's done other games, and he's now running a successful publishing company and congratulations to him. Um, you know, I'm really happy that somebody was able to take their homebrewed game that they designed at home and suddenly they're now a games publisher and he's designed a few games since then. So it's brilliant. Gloom of Killforth, the artwork is just unbelievable. I mean, I, I spoke to somebody a couple of weeks ago who said they don't like the artwork in Gloom of Killforth and I thought they were crazy because artwork is very subjective. But I look at the artwork in that game and wow, it's, it's just amazing, okay? Now, unfortunately, so there's all, there's all the good stuff out of the way. Unfortunately, the rule book is not good. Um, I, I had a read through the rule book. Now, bearing in mind, I have a more critical eye on rule books than other people because it's my job. Um, I get paid for telling people what's wrong with their rule books and then fixing them. I'm also, I also know that writing a good rule book is very, very hard. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of pairs of eyes on it. It isn't just a one person job. And the rule book for Gloom of Killforth, the original one, really wasn't good. Um, and I know I gave Tristan some feedback on it, but, you know, I was giving him feedback kind of for free. So I spent a few hours just writing up some notes about it, but it did need a lot of work. I since read that the second printing of the rule book was a bit better, but still still not good at all. Um, so that that's disappointing. And I do really want a good rule book with the game because, you know, I have an opinion now that why would I spend hours and hours and hours and hours having to watch loads and loads of videos and read pages and pages of FAQ on BGG when I could just go and play another game that's got a good rule book. You know, I don't have the time these days like I did, you know, 15 years ago, I'd get a game and it'd have a terrible rule book and I'd see it as a challenge. And I'd spend a month of my life working out how to play just so I can say, yay, I've done it. Now I'm like, not interested, not interested at all. The other thing about the game, from my experience, uh, of playing a few rounds of it and talking to friends who've played it is unfortunately it is a little more on the talisman side of things than the mage knight side of things and it's a bit on the long and random side so whilst the artwork is good and i i love what tristan's done with the game it's one which i don't think i'm going to particularly enjoy playing that much myself so yeah there's no plans to do any coverage of that on the channel but i think ricky royal has done some videos on it so if you want to check ricky royal's channel ricky does a load of solo playthroughs and they're really good. So I would definitely recommend Ricky's channel for learning how to play the game. Right, there you go. Um, El Bandy wants to know, if there was one board game you'd like to have worked on the rulebook for, which would it be and why? We've had that. That was 
that was asked somewhere else. Yes. Um, Frodo wants to know, you've mentioned roads and boats. I bought it as a retirement gift for myself. Was that retirement from my previous job? Yes, it was. So when I, when I left my previous job, a full-time employment, I kind of joked that I was retiring um, and then went actually into my new job working for myself where I worked twice as many hours a week as I used to uh, for half the pay. Um, so yeah, that was back in 2000 and yeah, six years ago. So um, yeah, bought it myself as a retirement present because I'd always wanted roads and boats. It's vastly overpriced for what it is, um, but it, it was just one of those silly things. I've always wanted to have it. I've always wanted to play it. So I just thought I'm going to make this happen. Uh, and I ordered it from Games Law, bought it, and that was that was my retirement gift. Um, on that note, do you have any plans for how long you will continue gaming rules? I do. Um, forever is is the honest answer to it. <laughs> To, to be honest, there's a few people in life who are the kind of people who never retire. Um, and that's going to be me. Now, I'm not saying that when I'm 70 years old or 75 years old, I'm going to be working as much as I do now. I am going to cut down. But I have no plans to give this up. I like playing games. You know, this isn't just a career for me that I'm in and when I retire, I finish. I like playing games. Now that I've got everything in place to do live streaming, I also like spending time with friends. So why wouldn't I carry on playing games with friends and live streaming it? Okay, so my plan is to carry on doing this. Um, you always told your parents you were going to retire early. Did I? Well, yes, but that's because I was talking about my... I had a plan. Yeah, so when I, when I was 40, which was <laughs> a long time ago now, but when I was 40, I came up with a plan that I would actually retire when I was 50. Now, when I was 40, this was 10 years ago, so I'm 50 this year. When I was 40, gaming rules didn't exist. I had no idea that this would be a thing. My plan was to work until I was 50 and then retire and try and get some kind of part-time job in the games industry. That was a plan. Now, obviously, that happened a lot earlier. That happened when I was 44 rather than 45. And it's not a part-time job in the games industry. It's a, it's a full-time job. But I think as as the decades go on, I think I will hopefully cut down on the work, but I will still continue gaming rules and I'll still be producing content. Uh, Victoria uh, Lowe wants to know, what's the best story-driven adventure game you consider to be at the moment? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Um, story-driven adventure game. So there's a different, there's a scale. Okay, we're playing Aeon's End Legacy at the moment. It's fantastic. There is a story, okay? And there's a bit of a story at the start and there's a bit of a story at the end, but because of the Evolve deck, there's a little bit of a story in between as well. Okay, so we're enjoying that and there's a little bit of a story. However, I'm not enjoying that game because of the story. I'm enjoying that game because the game is great. I like the legacy aspect of it and I like the way it's evolving and the narrative is nice, but it's not a heavily narrative game. Tainted Grail, however, I am really enjoying Tainted Grail at the moment, with the caveat that we're playing with a whole load of house rules to remove some of the problems with the grind in the game. So we're not playing it with the official published rules, we're playing it with some, well, there are official story mode rules to reduce the grind, and we're playing with a couple of extras. But personally, I am finding that the story, the, the narrative aspect of Tainted Grail, the most... Is evocative the right word? It's thematic. The, the, the setting of Tainted Grail, for those who don't know, it's Arthurian legend mixed with kind of supernatural weirdness in this oldie world, which is kind of, it's supposed to be England, but it's Avalon, but it's an alternative history. It's not real, okay? But it's set sort of round the Knights of the Round Table, King Arthur time, um, but with wizards and stuff like that. And what it is is that there is this weirdness it's like this fog that's that's creeping in and all throughout the land there are these men here's and these men here's are lit and people keep lighting them and the power of the men here drives back the weirdness which is cool it's really really and and the, the artwork for the game and all of the figures and the sculpting and everything else i just i just really i'm really into the theme of the game and the setting of the game really really enjoy it um, and basically what's happened in the story is that the power of these men here is a failing and the weirdness is creeping in. 
and it's taking over the land and you're having to go round and you're having to sacrifice stuff to relight these men here to keep them going to allow you to explore the narrative i think uh, i think is brilliant i think i think it's really well written i know some other reviewers have slated the writing and saying it's terrible personally i think it's really well written and reading the narrative of the game i'm i'm really enjoying that and it's very much um when you get into a place it's very much like a choose your own adventure so if you want to do this turn to this page and this page yeah i'm really enjoying that at the moment uh tainted grail is coming to steam for early access on the 25th of june are you going to stream it well i don't know if i'm allowed to say that i'm actually going to be getting a sneak advance copy of it and i'm going to be streaming it on the 18th of june but i just said it so yes um I'm actually signed up for the Tainted Grail beta. Um, I have a working relationship with Awakened Realms. And yeah, they have they have told me last week that they are going to try and get me a copy of that game. That's coming. So it's Tainted Grail and it isn't an adaptation of the board game. It's a different game. OK, so it's the same setting and it's got the same name, but it's actually a role playing game style adventure game that uses the same theme. It isn't just a computer game version of the board game. Um, but yeah, hopefully 18th of June, if they can work it out right, I've got it in my calendar. I will be doing a stream of it. I'll be getting early, early access. So yes, um, Caroline is here in the chat. Thank you for joining in. Uh, I love board games, but in the past, you haven't liked your attempts to play games online. Do you have any suggestions for games that you should try to overcome your dislike of online gaming? Yes, a couple of them. First of all, pick a game that you already like. Okay, so don't, don't jump in and go, oh yeah, I fancy learning how to play game X. It has an online implementation. I'll do that. Okay, so find a game that you already know how to play and that you already like and find people that you like playing games against and that you're comfortable talking to. So, you know, if, if I'm free and there's a game that you know and you want to play with me and we've got some time, give me a shout, let me know. We can, we can try and arrange it. Um, but that's what I'd do to start with because... Some of the online implementations, especially the ones where, like on Board Game Arena or wherever, it does all of the admin for you. And if you're trying to learn a new game by using that kind of interface, you'll press end turn, a load of stuff will happen on screen and you're like, I don't understand that. And if you don't understand what's going on, excuse me, you're not, you're not going to be able to learn really how to play the game. So I think you should know the game first so that you understand what's going on in the background. Uh, Benjamin says that you started board gaming, uh, hobby board gaming a year ago. Excellent. And now you're even buying inserts for your games. What's your opinion on inserts? You buy folded space most of the times, but sometimes eRaptor. I'm actually going to, going to be covering some eRaptor stuff on the channel in the next couple of months. So on, on my next video log, eRaptor is sending me something and I'm going to be covering that in the next video log. Um, what's my thought on inserts? Well, I have mixed thoughts on inserts because I've got a few of them and they look really good, okay? Now, I'm not somebody who complains about the setup time. I have no problem with a big box filled with Ziploc bags and you open the box and you spend five minutes emptying everything out of the Ziploc bags. I have no problem with that. I know other people who find that the most frustrating experience in the world. And for them, an insert is fantastic because they open the box, they take the insert out, they put it on the table, they take that box out, there you go, there you go, there you go, done. And that's really good. The one that I've got for an acronym is really good. You can open it out and you can do that. But as I say, I personally don't have a problem with Ziploc bags. The downside of the inserts is when they are built for storing the games horizontally. So you put all the inserts in, it all looks really nice. And then you put the lid on and you put it on your shelf and it's all fine. However, I then take it off the shelf. I put it in my bag. I take it somewhere. I get it somewhere and everything's fallen out. And a lot of the inserts are not designed properly so that things stay in place. Some of them are, and those ones that are are great, but some of them, a lot of the components fly around. The other slight problem I have with inserts is when you've got a little small area and you've got wooden cubes in it, I can't get the wooden cubes out of the corner. It, you know, we're, I've got a little wooden box to store our tainted grail cubes in. And every time we need to take a cube from the box, it's actually, it's harder. So I'm just going to tip, tip the cubes out onto the table. It's much easier just having a pile of components. So yeah, that might be just me. Right, what's next? Uh, Adam's in the chat. Adam says, uh, have you played the new Mind Clash game Perseverance? If so, what are your thoughts on it? Right, so I can tell you, no, I haven't played it. 
my thoughts on it are I'm super, super excited about it because it's Mind Clash, uh, and Mind Clash do fantastic games. So the production quality is going to be brilliant. Um, it's going to be a complex game. It's going to be right in my wheelhouse. I know bits about it, but I'm happy to say that I will be covering it on the channel. In fact, if it weren't for coronavirus, two weeks ago, the whole of the Mind Clash games team would have been here in this room and we would have been playing it and it would have gone out on the channel. That's what would have happened. However, with the coronavirus and everything else that's happening, we've had to cancel all of those plans and we've rearranged them. But I can tell you, it is in my calendar. So I'm just going to look in my calendar. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Work schedule. Here we go. Right. So start of July. So on the 2nd of July, the day before my birthday, I am doing a live Q&A with uh, David Turtsey and the Mind Clash team about Perseverance. And then the following week, on the Monday and the Tuesday, I will be doing some live streams of Perseverance. I'm going to be playing the game with them remotely. I think, I think the plan is that they're going to send me a physical copy of the game. I am going to have it here. I am going to be live streaming it. I'm going to be talking to them on Skype. They're going to teach me how to play. We're going to be playing it and I'm going to be moving the bits around. I think that's the plan. But yeah, expect that coming to the channel at the start of July. So I haven't played it yet, but I will be playing it soon. Uh, Tony Bordell's here. What's your favourite fruit? Oh, that's a good question. What do I like? I can't hear you. Grapes. I like grapes. Grapes are a fruit? Yeah, I love grapes. I mean, I like quite a few fruit, but... I mean, I have a banana every day in my porridge, um, or my yogurt. I like pears. Apples, eh, not so much. But yeah, grapes. Definitely like grapes. Where did that question come from, Tony? It's a good question. And it's one that I can actually answer, unlike a lot of the other questions I get asked, which make me think too much. But yeah, I like, I like grapes. Uh, Andrew is saying, are there any mass market board games that get a pass? Looking at my shelf, I can see the really nasty horse racing game, Scrabble and Scategories, which get played from time to time. Cherries. cherries. Oh, yeah, I love cherries as well. Um, which is my favourite, grapes or cherries? Cherries. Yeah. Apologies for the previous misinformation. It's cherries. Um, mass market board games that get a pass. There is. There's, there's one that I can think of. A mass market board game that's actually okay as a game. I'm going to put it to the chat. I'm going to put this one to the chat. Please list a mass market board game that you think it gets a pass, i.e. will still be able to be played by gamers who won't turn their nose up at it and say this is awful. And I'm not talking mass market as in code names, which is now mass market, um, or something like Telestrations, which is just, you know, it's fun. But yeah, mass market board games that you think get a pass uh, and are still playable compared to a modern board game. Uh, Vicky likes Connect 4. Yes, not talking Connect 4. <laughs> um, so yeah, you've got really nasty horse racing game, which I think I've played. Scrabble, Scategories, not sure. Ah, Board Pep is here. Hi Pep, thank you for joining in. Uh, what do you think about role-playing games like D&D in person once the lockdown is over? What do you think about playing role-playing games like D&D in person once the lockdown is over? So I, I used to play D&D. In fact, I started in the board gaming hobby uh, well, I started in the gaming hobby in like 1983 and it all started with D&D and I played D&D for like 25 years and I dabbled with other role-playing games as well. I stopped when I moved down to the southwest of England because I, I was getting seriously into the board gaming side of things then um, and the role-playing games were taking a lot of my time because I was GMing two weekly groups. So yeah, I, I did do a lot of role-playing in the past and I haven't done any now for 12 years. What do I think about it when lockdown ends? Uh, is that was that the question? Where's it gone? Oh, I missed the question from uh, from Adam. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, yeah, what do I think about playing role playing games like D and D in person once the lockdown is over? I probably won't. I mean, every so often I go through this. Oh, I'd like to play a role playing game again. And thankfully for me, it doesn't last. Now I say thankfully because I know that. If I go, oh yeah, I'll play a role-playing game again, and then I find people to play a role-playing game with, and then I start playing a role-playing game, that's going to take me away from the board gaming. And I'm really enjoying the board gaming. And I would have to say, 
right now, unless I find the perfect group and the perfect setting, I would probably always prefer a board game to a role-playing game where I am in my gaming career now. Ask me again in five years' time when I've given up board gaming and I'm now playing role-playing games, who knows? The other thing is that I sort of get a, a bit of my fix on some role-playing game stuff from games like Gloomhaven, Tainted Grail, you know, even the Pathfinder Adventure card game that we're going to be playing. I get a little bit of my fix from them. They're not a patch on a role-playing game at all, okay? Not, not a patch on it, but they give me that little bit of a fix. So, yeah, I'm not, I have no plans to go back to role-playing games, um, but, and you're saying in person, would I now play a role-playing game remotely with people? Yeah, I probably would now. And again, like I mentioned earlier on with the organisation of online board gaming, it's actually easier to organise. Um, so there was a question from Adam about what my favourite Mind Clash game is and why. Well, I'm doing a review of Tracherian, which is going to be out tonight, so uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I like all of them and they're all sufficiently different. You know, I love Cerebria because it is so different. The theme is unique. The team play aspect is unique. I'd probably have to go in Akrony as, as for my favourite one. I like all of them for different reasons, but I think an Akrony is probably my favourite one. 10% uh, remaining on my battery. So, an answers that people have got to Andrew's question. Um, so, these are games which people have said, mass market games, which are still, they get a pass. So, Scrabble. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of Scrabble because it's basically people who can spell words win. It's the, you know, the skill in it is just being able to spell and knowing words uh, rather than a, another skill. Articulate. Is that the game I don't like? Yeah, I know, but is that the one I don't like? Is that the one where you've got to make stuff up? No, that's Boulder Dash, isn't it? I can't remember Articulate. Uh, oh, chess and go. Yeah, chess or go or, or anything like that. Uh, Boulder Dash says Ian Turner. Yeah, Boulder Dash is the game. I think it's a bit like Snake Oil, where you've got to make stuff up or something, or you've got to write something down and you've got to be creative. Yeah, I'm not creative. Um, the Hexy Beast says Risk. Yeah, you see, I, I don't think Risk has a place in modern board gaming. I think the, um, the adaptations of Risk, like Risk 2010 and stuff like that, they have a place, but original Risk, I, d I don't think that has a place anymore because um, of the problem. Does Jaws count, says Scott? No, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> uh, Rummy Cub, says Claire. Still love it. Now, we played that once on a cruise, on the Egyptian cruise. We played Rummy Cub. So, yeah. Um, Patience, Chess, Checkers and Go. Yeah, okay. Um, Paul Luxton is also saying Articulate is a mass market game and quite a decent game. I need to look into Articulate then. I have played it. It's not the one where you draw a card and it's a... Uh, Sometimes it's uh, charades and sometimes it's this and sometimes... No? Okay, I'll look at that. Uh, bridge, does that count? I guess so. And Ian Turner says tiddlywinks. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> um, right, so a few questions left and then we are going to have to wrap things up. Um, so Tom D wants to know, have you ever played any war games, Hex Encounter? I grew up playing Hex Encounter war games, okay? So when I was into gaming in the 80s, uh, Hex Encounter war games were a thing and I had a few of them. Um, and I wanted to play more of them. I mentioned right at the start of this stream, Dragon Pass, which is a Hex Encounter war game for all intents and purposes. So every time I see a Hex Encounter war game, I have this nice, warm, fuzzy feeling because I, I used to, I, I say I played them when I was growing up. I, I don't think I actually did. I think I had some of them and I looked at them and I read the rules of them and I may have set them up at home, but I don't know whether I ever played them. But I love the idea of the tiny little counters that didn't punch properly with the misprinted tiny little bits of numbers in the corner and hundreds of chits recreating a battle from World War II or something like that. There's something about that that I really like, but those games tend to be super, super complex. Um, so yes, what do I think of them? Um, I, I've not played them much, but I really would like to. And I know people who play them and they do look, they do look great. Um, Right, did I check out Blood Rage and Imperial Settlers Roll and Write digital versions? I haven't, no, I haven't looked at those. Um, Imperial Settlers Roll and Write, I played and I wasn't that much of a fan of. Um, so I'm not that interested in the digital version of that. Um, Blood Rage is a game that I've not actually played. But yeah, if there's a digital version, I might, I might check that out. 
Tamane says, one of the new subscribers, thank you very much, welcome. You'd love to see my collection if it's possible. I can put some photos on social media, yeah. Um, I mean, the thing is, I could send you a link to my Board Game Geek. Um, if you look up Paul Grogan on Board Game Geek, no space, you can see my collection on there. It isn't quite correct. There are many games that I've received which I haven't updated, and there are some that I got rid of that I've forgotten to remove. But overall, my collection is on Board Game Geek, so you can find it on there. Um, with all the big cons being cancelled and some of the pre-releases hype diminished, are any of the, any games that I'm looking forward to this year? Because of my position in the industry and because I'm working on so many games that are coming out this year, I'm generally not aware of any other ones that are coming out this year other than the ones that I'm working on. And I don't want to really use this as an opportunity to mention the games that I'm working on that are coming out this year because people will think, oh, Paul's just talking about the games he's working on. That's all I know. I mean, I mentioned Perseverance from Mind Clash. Um, there's another game that I'm involved with which is going on Kickstarter in a month's time. There's another game that I'm working on that's going on Kickstarter in December. Um, there's another game which I'm involved in which is going in, on Kickstarter in January of next year that I've just been sent the rulebook of. I could talk about those, but I'm not going to. But because, you know, I'm, I'm, I work a lot and I get millions of emails and I'm so involved in the games that I'm working on, that means that I'm not fully aware of all of the other games that are coming out each year. So for the last three years, my pre-Essen, what games am I looking forward to at Essen video is basically me asking everybody else, tell me what games you think I would like that are coming out at Essen. And I just use those answers because I, I don't generally have time to look, which is a shame because I used to. Um, have you ever drove to a castle to test your eyesight? Have you ever drove to a castle to test your eyesight? I don't, I don't get that. Is that a reference to something? Yeah, my eyesight's getting gradually worse on a weekly basis. Is it a thing? Okay, so Vicky knows what it is and she's not telling me. Um, what's next for the cult of the old stream? So this is the last question that I'm going to be asked, I think. Yeah, last question. So no more questions, please. My Patreon campaign that I've mentioned a couple of times, but if you like the content I make, please support me on Patreon. Just a dollar a month all helps. Um, one of the goals which I was trying to reach at the start of this year was called Cult of the Old. And we reached that goal, which means every so often I will get out an old game, so somewhere between 15 years old or more, and I will do video coverage of it. And this is because I think a lot of the old games still deserve a place. A lot of the old games still deserve some attention. Some of them are still really good. And so many people are just all about the Cult of the New. A lot of content creators, and this is no criticism of them, because I know how it is, is they're always just showing the new hot game, the new hot game, and then a week later, gone. And then the next hot game, and then the next hot game. And that's how it is. When you're a content creator, you've got to show the new hot games because that's what people are interested in. But I wanted to give the old games some life. So we made that stretch goal, not stretch goal, we made the goal of the patron campaign, Cult of the Old. We did Hero Quest last week, which was awful. It was a fun stream to do but it's an awful game. Um, I don't know what's next. I'm tempted to go with one of the Spiel des Jahres winners. So something like Alhambra, Thurnum Taxes, something like that. I will be putting a poll up on my Patreon page for them to choose what game is gonna be next. So at some point in the next month, I'm gonna do a, a poll on my Patreon page, basically say, yeah, give me some ideas for an old game that you want to see me cover, um, and then it will get coverage. Um, obviously doing Hero Quest was a bit of a laugh and it was a bit of fun. We kind of knew how that was going to go, but I want to do some older Euro games and then maybe mix it up with some old, you know, really old games from, from my past. Anyway, that is everything. So we are, well, it's not bad. One hour 42. We started three minutes late. Are you hungry? Yeah, I'm starving. So we're all done. Contest. Final chance. If you are watching this either live or if you're watching this anytime before 10 p.m. on Thursday, the 28th of May, enter the contest. You need to send me an email, paul.grogan at outlook.com with the word Trickerian. And if you are a patron supporter, mention that in the email and you will get two entries instead of one. And basically, one lucky person who gets drawn will win £25 worth of game vouchers from a games retailer. If you're not in the UK, you can still enter the contest and we will get you the game somehow. So £25 of vouchers you will still save money by buying from them, uh, even if you're in America. There was one other question earlier on, which I did miss. 
which was from Andrew to say, can non-UK residents participate in Gridcon? Gridcon or virtual Gridcon is open to everybody. OK, so I'm going to make it is a Discord channel. The link will be there. And if gaming happens 24 hours a day, that's excellent. So, yes, virtual Gridcon. As I say, if you're on Facebook, go to the Gridcon Facebook group and join. Uh, if you're not on Facebook, go to the Gridcon website, gridcon.co.uk. But there'll be more information coming in the next couple of weeks. It's going to be free to attend. We're going to be raising money for charity. It's going to be gaming all day, every day for three days. Uh, and that is everything. Thumbs up. I can't. Video. The video. What video? Oh, yeah. Thumbs up the video. <laughs> yeah. I'll get to know what Vicky's saying to me eventually. Yeah. Re please remember to thumb up on the video. And if you get a chance, just leave a comment on there other than the live comments. Thanks very much for that. So what's coming up on the channel soon is the Trakirian review. I might get it finished tonight. I'd really like to get it finished tonight. So Trakirian review will be going live hopefully tomorrow. Then maybe tomorrow I've got... Um, what are the other reviews I'm doing? Oh, Lancaster uh, and then Nemo's War. I should be doing three reviews this week. It might be a bit of a push based on how long this one's taken me. Um, Friday night, I'm doing Euthea Torment of Resurrection solo playthrough. Saturday, I've got the live code names. So that's happening on the channel. There are still spaces. If you want to play code names with me on Saturday morning or Sunday morning, drop me a message. We still have a few places left. Um, yeah, that's it, I think. And then, um, yeah, more news about Virtual Gridcon coming in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that's everything. Right. Thank you very much to everybody for joining in. Take care. Have a good evening. And I will see you all next time. Take care. Proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com.